consider this morning. That will be the basis for our message. It's kind of our gospel reading in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. We bow our heads in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, as we approach the judgment day, as we consider this wonderful and yet scary day, may we never fear. May we never doubt whether or not we are sheep or goats. Remind us that you are our good shepherd who sought us and saved us. Remind us that you are our righteousness, so therefore, whenever we fear Judgment Day, give us comfort, give us hope, and teach us that we have no reason for fear. In your most holy name we pray. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, in Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, the one who is both our Good Shepherd and also our Judge. If I say the word Armageddon, what pictures come to your mind? Unicorns, lollipops, sweetness and light? Probably not. Whenever I hear the word Armageddon, it's probably being a child of the 90s. I think back to the great Sean Connery movie, Hunt for Red October. And if you've ever seen that movie initially, it starts out in Russian. And then Sean Connery's the KGB agent who's asking him, why on earth do you have a Bible in your office? And he starts to read this marked passage in Revelation. It starts in Russian to go to the word Armageddon. Then all of a sudden it switches into English. And it's a very appropriate text for that movie because what's Hunt for Red October about? It's about the Cold War. It's about a nuclear sub that might be going renegade and heading towards the United States and potentially starting off nuclear warfare. Armageddon is not something that when we think about it, woohoo, we get to think about the end times. A lot of times when we think about Armageddon, the last days, Judgment Day, things like that, we can get very afraid very quickly. Back in 1965, when Barry McGuire said that we are on the eve of destruction, that great folk song, he was not talking about what a wonderful thing this world is. These last few weeks of the church here, as we're approaching Advent, as we're approaching our celebration of Christ's joy-filled, humble first coming into this world at Christmas, our text focused on Christ's second coming, the time that he will come in glory to judge both the living and the dead, as we confess in our creed every Sunday. And it's the stuff of rejoicing, but it's also the stuff of nightmares. To steal from Charles Dickens, it is the best of times, and it is the worst of times. As saints receive their eternal reward, and then the wicked, the unrighteous, then are condemned to hell. So as we look at this scene in Matthew chapter 25, as we consider Judgment Day, as we think about the separation of sheep and goats, the question that we need to ask ourselves about this text is, what is the vital difference? What is the vital difference on the one hand between the sheep, between the saints, and on the other hand between the goats, the wicked, the unrighteous who are then sent off to hell? When we understand the answer to this question, what's that vital difference, then we realize that there is no reason for you and me as Christians, as saints, as baptized children of God, for us to ever fear that last day, that judgment day. Now, if you have ever been wondering about the last day, what scripture best describes Judgment Day, this is the place for you. In Matthew 24 and 25, during Holy Week, right during his passion, Jesus went to the top of the Mount of Olives, and then his disciples follow him. Jesus had been foretelling all of these awful things that were going to happen. He foretold that the Temple of Jerusalem, the focal point of the Jewish religion, the city of David, would eventually be taken apart brick by brick, stone by stone. He foretold the judgment that would come upon the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the hypocrites, all those who oppose him and his divine mission. And all these warnings of woe peaked in the disciples' interest. And so they did what all of us should do. Whenever there's something in the God's word, whenever there's something Jesus says to us, the first thing that we should do is have that question and then take that to him. And that's what the disciples did. And so they ask the question, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the close of this age? And then that prompted the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and 25. A very detailed, vivid description of what the end times would be. And our text for today, Matthew 25, 31 through 46, that's the culmination of this discourse. And here Jesus in picturesque language describes what Judgment Day is going to be like. The Son of Man, the exalted Jesus Christ, will come in all of his glory. All of the nations, everybody who has ever lived, all who have ever been on the face of the earth will be in his presence. And there is no longer going to be any question. There is not going to be any doubt about who Jesus is. 
Paul said that at that day, Christ, who's exalted the throne of God, everyone will know who he is. That every knee will bow at the name of Christ in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That happens at Judgment Day. There's no second chance. There is no opportunity to repent or come to faith. The time of grace has expired, and so judgment has already been made, and now it's time for that verdict to be made public, to be rendered. So Jesus Christ, the judge and the good shepherd, he separates the gathering. The sheep go to the right, and then the goats go off to the left. So let's start with the goats. They're more interesting animals. So let's start with them. Goats, obviously, are those who have been rejected by Jesus. Verse 41, depart from me, you curse, into the eternal fire. Prepare for the devil and his angels. So that's the verdict. Now, what's the rationale for that verdict? Well, we see that in verse 42 and following. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. As you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. So that's Christ's verdict. Now, is it a just verdict? That's the question that the goats raise, that those on who are declared to be unrighteous, that's what they have, because they are confused by this verdict. Verse 45, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? So they push back. So you say we didn't do all of this stuff. We, on the other hand, we think we probably did do it. We don't really know, but nevertheless, when did we not do this? So they're questioning the justice of Christ's words of condemnation. But Jesus' verdict is just. It's not arbitrary. It's not based on his random whims. Rather, Jesus' judgment is based upon the promise that was baked into God's dealings with humanity. And perhaps this is best seen in Deuteronomy 30, verse 16 and 18. Here's God's covenant with his people. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today, by loving the Lord your God by walking in his ways, by keeping his commandments and his statutes and his rules, then you shall live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your hearts turn away, and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are going over the Jordan to enter and possess. And so that's the covenant that God gave to his people Israel. If you obey the commandments of God perfectly, if you are righteous perfectly, if you follow all of my rules perfectly, if you never transgress my law in one easy, tiny bit perfectly, then you will live. Then you'll be blessed. Then you'll receive your heavenly inheritance. But if you turn your heart away from God, if you violate my law in the least way, if you have any transgression whatsoever in the least way, then you will perish. And nowhere in Scripture does it say that if your acts of charity outweigh your selfish deeds, then you'll live. Nowhere does it say that if you feed more people than you allow to starve, then you're going to be okay. That if you clothe more people than you leave in tattered garments, or that your love is somehow a little bit better than mediocre, then you'll be blessed. Then you'll live. Then you'll receive heaven. Then God will shower you with blessings. God nowhere ever says that. Instead, Scripture is clear that obedience has to be total, that righteousness has to be absolute. And this is what the Lord requires of us in his law. If we obey perfectly, then we will live. If we don't, then even one sin negates all of our good deeds. But it's actually worse than all that because sin not only negates our good deeds, but rather it also corrupts them because they are then sinful in the eyes of God. Sin so thoroughly corrupts every single thought and action that Isaiah says that all of our righteous deeds are like polluted garments in the eyes of God. So the, even if I'm, in my own estimation, a good, generous, charitable, loving, kind individual, a good human being, God doesn't count all those good deeds as righteous as my count. Even if I have clothed all of Salt Lake County, it's as though I've clothed nobody. Even if I have fed every hungry person in this world, it's as though I have fed no one because of that deep-rooted sinful nature within me. And that's the logic of Christ's verdict. What we're seeing here is a result of pointing to our own righteousness, our own love, service, generosity, charity, and decency on Judgment Day. 
If all I can do on that day is stand before God's throne and feverishly, desperately reminisce about all the wonderful things I have done to help this person and that person, then we don't have any true defense. Because Jesus is going to be true to his word. Jesus is going to hold up his law, and he's going to hold up that standard perfection, show it to our lives, and show how miserably we have failed in doing so, and then say, depart from me, you curse, because you have violated God's law. Because of my sin, that's the verdict that I deserve to hear. But thankfully on Judgment Day, that is not the only verdict that is rendered. There's a second verdict, and that's the first one in our text. It begins at verse 34. Then the king will say to those in his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? (coughs) And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. The thing that always astounds me every time I read this text is that the response of the saints and the response of the unrighteous are precisely the same. They are absolutely oblivious to what Christ is talking about. The wicked think that they have done all the stuff, and Jesus says, no, you haven't. The saints are saying, when on earth do we do all these things? And Jesus says, yes, you did. Everyone here is confused about the verdicts that the Lord hands out. But Jesus is not confused. Jesus knows precisely why he is handing out his verdict. And here's the thing. When we take a look at this text, that question I asked at the beginning, what is the vital difference between the sheep and the goats, between the saints and the unrighteous? Jesus Christ is the vital difference. Jesus Christ is the vital difference between being a saint and a goat. Being covered in the blood of the Savior of the entire world is the difference between being a sheep and a goat. Being justified through your faith in the Son of Man and the Son of God who redeemed you from every one of your sins through his holy life and his innocent death. That is the difference between being a saint and being unrighteous. Having Christ as your righteousness, that will be the vital difference on Judgment Day. And so let's spell that out. We cannot be saved by our works. That's what the verdict that's rendered to the ghost reminds us of. We cannot be saved by our works, so therefore Christ intervened on our behalf. The eternal Son of God became a man so that his works would become our works, so that his works would become our love. Think about what this means every time you're paging through the Gospels. Every miracle that Christ ever performed, every famished person that he fed, every oppressed person he noticed, every time he placed God's priorities over his own earthly comfort and needs, everything that Jesus Christ did and every breath that he took was an act of redemption by which he was holy and righteous in our place. Jesus lived the life praised on this Judgment Day verdict, and he lived it not for himself, But he lived it for us. While we all deserve to hear the words that are given to the goats, in his infinite mercy, Jesus Christ experienced the eternal help prepared for the devil and his angels, so that instead we would hear the wonderful proclamation that we are blessed by our Father, that we inherit the kingdom prepared for us from the foundation of the world. Christ makes all the difference because by faith, his holy life becomes our own. When God sees us, he sees his son, Jesus Christ. When he searches our lives, he sees that of his son. That's what justification means. That's the result of being declared righteous in God's eyes. And it's something that occurs to us purely by God's grace in our lives as we trust in him. As Paul writes, we are justified by faith apart from works of the law. When you believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior, that he paid the penalty of all of your sins, that apart from him there is no way for you to be saved, all of which God causes you to believe through his holy word, then Christ's life becomes yours. His holiness becomes yours. And therefore, heaven becomes yours right now at this moment. Christ makes all the difference, brothers and sisters. And that's why when we think about Armageddon, when we think about judgment, then we think about the end times, there's absolutely no reason for you and me to fear. In fact, we have already heard God's judgment day verdict for us. We heard that verdict when water and word were poured over us in holy baptism, and we were declared to be God's precious children. 
we hear that Judgment Day verdict whenever we gather together and Christ declares on, our pastor declares on Christ's behalf that all of us are forgiven of each and every one of our sins because of what Christ has done for us. And when we approach this altar in a few moments to re receive Christ's body and blood, there is that Judgment Day verdict again saying that because this body and blood was broken and shed for you, your sins are forgiven. They are as far away from you as the east is from the west, so therefore you have no reason to fear God, because heaven is yours. That's what we hear when we gather together to worship. And when Judgment Day finally occurs, we are not going to hear anything different. We may be surprised. We may be stunned at the amazing grace that God has for each and every one of us. But we will be praising God that Christ has made all the difference, and that he will give us that heavenly inheritance that's even ours right now. In Christ's most holy name, amen. And please receive your Lord's blessing. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding, keep and guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, amen. We continue with the offertory, seeing created me a clean heart, O God, I invite you to please stand as you are able.